The Gospel lesson is taken from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 48. The translation from which I am reading is the New Revised Standard Version. The text is printed in the worship folder for you to follow while reading. If you are physically able in the honor of the reading of the Gospel lesson, please stand. Listen to these words from St. Matthew 5. You have heard that is what what it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. 
But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the right, righteous, righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not, do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not, do not even the, the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is inspired by the God of the, of the people of God. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable unto you, O God, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. I am very happy to be asked to come here and preach and to share with you some problems people have had with Jesus. And I'll tell you what I've learned. I will read again what you heard this morning, but I say to you, you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes the rain, the sun, rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. It begins with, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy. Critics have looked at this for 2,000 years. Love your enemy. The last few days we have seen who our enemy is. It's east of Jerusalem. What are we going to do? Here is the greatest mind we know and he says, love your enemies. How can we love someone that is killing our brother? How can we love one that has killed our son? How can we love one who has taken and cut into many pieces an innocent man? Please tell me something is wrong. For thousands of years, people thought maybe something happened as a scribe was copying the Aramaic, then translated it into Greek, or maybe it was copied in Greek wrong and then copied again. We have nothing from the New Testament that dates from the first century. Most of our New Testament Gospels we work on are late 2nd or 3rd or 4th or even 5th century. Some of those are our best texts. Over five centuries, things can happen. Is that what happened? No. There is no text in Coptic or Syriac or Greek or Aramaic that says, do not love your enemy. It's very simple. A little particle could have fallen out, but it didn't. Jesus said, love your enemies. Is he ignorant of Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan, Damerlane, Hitler, 
Osama bin Laden? Of course he couldn't know no one knows. But he knew about Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes, who cut Jews into little pieces. He knew about the Maccabees, how many of them were crucified one after the other. He had walked through the hills and he had seen men crucified just a little bit west of Nazareth. When he was a little boy, he often walked along and saw the remains of a man who had lain on the cross, hung on the cross for up to two weeks. We know people have survived after being on a cross for two weeks. The ravens eat your eyes after the first hour. What is left of the man and how long does he live? That's another story. But Jesus has seen terrible suffering. He'd seen his compatriots stoned to death. That's very rapid. And your best friend could knock your brains out. But to hang on a tree all day, all week, and another week, and your mother, your wife, your children looking up. Jesus saw suffering. He saw what Romans did. He taught us to love our enemies. So the charge against him is not that he was innocent, unperceptive. He probably thought he was going to die. He never thought he'd be crucified. When he's walking, walking up to Jerusalem, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who persecute the prophets, proof that he thought he was a prophet, and stone those sent to you. Here is Jesus thinking that he is going to Jerusalem and will be stoned. That's how Jews put to death other Jews. Jeremiah was stoned to death. Was he thinking he was like Jeremiah, being sent to Jerusalem to be stoned? He knew suffering. I think Kierkegaard is one of the ones, the great mind, the Dane, who said, Jesus' greatest suffering was not in Gethsemane. It was not on the cross. It was not in Gethsemane when he says, Oh, Father, please remove the cup from me. You know the symbolism, the bitter cup of death. You know the symbolism on the cross, my God, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, why, O oh God, have you forsaken me? Jesus knew suffering. He knew his life was of suffering. And Kierkegaard was right. The greatest suffering for Jesus was not in Gethsemane, it was on, on the, not on the cross. But when he had to instruct Peter over and over again, and when he said to his students, his disciples, how long do you have to be with me? Not one of them understood him during his lifetime. They all forsook him and fled. Now that is great suffering. The greatest suffering of a teacher is not being able to communicate and reach those that need to be taught. So Jesus knew suffering. Love your enemy. Love your enemy. Jesus had many enemies, as you well know. So he knew what he was talking about. He didn't know about Mussolini and Hitler. But he had seen horrible suffering. Probably one of the worst despots in history was Herod the Great. You know it because of the killing of the innocents. That may not be historical, but it's historically founded. He killed his sons. Herod was a ruthless murderer, an evil man. So Jesus knew about evil people. And he knew the Herodians were after him, that is the descendants of Herod. But we don't want to be too academic. Look what happened to his cousin. Put into prison in Macarios, John the Baptizer. When John was martyred, did Jesus suffer? Of course. He knew suffering. He knew it would eventually define his life. Love your enemies. Now, how could the most brilliant moral teacher of all time teach you that? If you love your enemies, that means you know who your enemies are. 
None of you know who your enemies are. You've known through your life those who you thought were your enemies have become friends. The most powerful force in the world is not the atom bomb. It is not the hydrogen bomb. It is love. Love can turn someone who dislikes you and you think is an enemy into your best friend. Some of you have experienced that. Love your enemy. Jesus is not blind that you have enemies, but he's perceptive that love can turn enemies into friends. This passage that I read to you, Love Your Enemies, is in Matthew and Luke. It goes back to a very early saying of jo source of Jesus. We have these sayings of jo Jesus that take shape during his lifetime and then are written down maybe during his lifetime, but certainly by about 40. Luke and Matthew got a copy of this pre-gospel sayings of Jesus, and in it, Luke and Matthew have quoted, Love your enemies. One of the critical sources we use in methodology is to get back to Jesus. If it goes before Matthew, you know it, it's more authentic than what Matthew creates. If it goes beyond Luke, you know it's more authentic than what Luke creates. Here is Matthew and Luke saying, Jesus said, love your enemies. You know neither of them created it. It goes back very early. And Jesus was remembered in the 20s, 30s, and 40s to have said, love your enemies. His life was defined by enemies, the Pharisees, but especially the Sadducees. Some of you have seen the movie Chariots of Fire. There was a man named Eric Harry Little, a Scotsman. He ran the fastest quarter mile at the Olympics. 47.6 seconds. That's still very fast. Very few college players can run it in 47.6, but it wasn't his race. Eric Little, L-I-D-D-E-L-L, -L, was the fastest 200 meter runner in the world. And they had him to run on Sunday. He said, no, it's the Lord's day. I will not run on Sunday. So they chose Harold Abrams, his very good friend, the second fastest man in the world, both of them from England. Of course, one's from Scotland. I should have said Great Britain. Both are from Great Britain, one from England and one from Scotland. So Eric Little did not run the 100 meter. Harold Abrams won it. No one thought that Eric Little had a chance. He took off running the fastest 100 meters he had ever run. And afterwards he said, I started out running as fast as I could and then I ran faster. You know the story, you've seen the movie. He becomes a missionary. He was born in China and he died in China. He was born in 1902 and he died in 1945. But maybe you don't know the whole story. The British were very proud of their Olympic champion, a missionary in China. And they finally got permission. One person could be given permission to leave, leave the camp. They came with a piece of paper. We have come for one British citizen, and we want Eric Harry Little. They came to him and said, Eric, you can go home. He said, I'm a missionary. There's a woman here who is very sick. Take her. We have found his diary. He died in the camp in 1945. He was teaching in the morning. And he said, I'm teaching on Jesus' love commandment. Love your enemies. And I'm trying to take it seriously. Once I thought it was a metaphor. Try to like your enemies. Try to love your enemies. Try to. But Jesus never said try to. Love your enemies. 
The Greek is clearly that. Everybody gets it, whether it's a translation in German, French, Russian, English. All our translations love your enemy. So Eric Little is teaching them. He said, first I thought it, it would be possible to love your enemies. He said, maybe it was try to be a person that looks like he loves your enemies. He said, I began to study this. I would rise 15 minutes before anybody else in the camp and I would study this. Jesus meant love your enemies. He said, what a difference it has made. It hasn't changed any of my enemies, but it has changed me. When Jesus tells you to love your enemies, he's talking about you. Do you want to go to bed at night with someone who has hate? Do you want to be known as someone that knows how to love and really how to hate? Or do you want to be known as someone that follows Jesus and loves? Loves without restriction. You know love is the most powerful force in the world. Don't ever take the criticism that Christianity has been in the world for 2,000 years and look at the state of the world. There was a man preaching in Hyde's Park, you know, London, where the preachers go or the speakers go, and people will come in, and he was preaching about the importance of Christianity. And a drunk got up out of the streets and crawled in, and he was filled with dirt, and he was drunk, and he says, Past, Pastor! Look at what you're saying. Christianity has been in the world for 2,000 years. And look at what a chaos we have now. The preacher looked him in the eye and said, water has been in the world for millions of years. And look at the state of your face. The point is so clearly, we have been told to love. And we've not heard it. You can love. It may never change anybody. But it's not. Love your enemy to change your enemy. Jesus teaches you to love. It frees you. You're no longer sleeping with someone that's filled with hatred. How many people do we know that go to bed at night and toss and turn because they're filled with hate? They're suffering from themselves. Their enemies are not doing that. I've talked to many specialist, orthodontist. And I asked them, I'm very curious, how many of the people that come to you can you really heal? I was hoping he would say maybe 80%, because that would leave me 20% where Jesus can heal someone. He said, maybe 5%. That leaves me 95% that Jesus could heal. I said, what do you mean? The people who have trouble with their teeth, you can't do. He says, it's not physiological, it's psychological. All night long, they grind their teeth. And they've got root canals, they've got all kinds of problems, they've ground it down, and it's because they are full of tension. Love. Maybe you don't understand. Love your neighbor as yourself. The Christian too often is told, mea culpa, mea culpa, I'm no good. Jesus comes into your life and calls you gods. It's in the Gospel of John and it's in the Psalms. You are gods. Now I know I have a problem with some of you because you'll think egotistically. No, no, no. If you feel unworthy, God has called you worthy. If you feel not, you're not lovable, God has called you lovable. And God has said, the love that you have for others, love yourself. And out of that well, you know if you go into the desert and someone is dying because they need water and you didn't put water in your pail, you can't help them. But if you have filled your pail with love, when someone needs love, you can open it. Love is the greatest power. The problem is very simple as that man's dirty face. If you do not apply it, if you do not use it. Now don't think tonight you can go home and be a lover. 
It will take months and years, and all of a sudden you'll be able to develop it like the flute is today. It, she didn't play the flute for the first time. When I was a trumpet player starting at 11, I worked and worked and worked. Even when I had the flu, I would practice. Then I became trumpet soloist at Ohio Wesleyan Symphony and first trumpet at Duke. I kept practicing and practicing. All right, try it. Read these passages. Take your bulletin home. You can read it over and over again. Love your enemy. You know what happens when you love your enemy? You rob the enemy of their power. No matter how I treat him, he seems to come back with nice things. Maybe he's better or she is better than you than you think. So Harry Abrams wins the 100 meter. Eric Little wins a race he had never run, the 200 meters. Sets a world record in 47.6. He leaves a diary in which he says, Jesus tells us to love our enemies. The world is defined by my enemies. I'm in an enemy camp. I am now loving them. It hasn't changed them, but what a difference in my life. Eric Little. Now I've summarized three things I wanted to share with you and I wrote them down early this morning. I usually like to talk without even a note. Your face is my uh, manuscript. The first thing I wrote is enemies will be remembered from your thoughts, removed from your thoughts. Enemies will be removed from your thoughts. They will appear as those loved. That's the first thing will happen. You will not have enemies. You know what? They can't get to you anymore. You're protected by love. The second thing that will happen is enemies are changed. They're not going to get any satisfaction about you turning and twisting and saying, oh my God, it's terrible what you're doing to me. They can't hurt you anymore. And don't think that it's only older people that have enemies. It begins in first grade and earlier. The little enemies, the people making fun of you. They can't reach you if you are surrounded by love. And third, you will no longer sleep with a person who hates. No one wants to sleep with a hater. If you become one who loves your enemies, how much more will you love the person in your pew? How much more will you love your pastor, Jimmy? How much more will you love a scholar who winds his way from Princeton to Rome? Another Rome. You see, it's all about you. Jesus means freedom. I want to write a book on that. Jesus frees you from the condemnation of sin from the feeling that this is the only world there is, to a dream and a hope that is paved by love. And we can say, yes, Lord Jesus, I will love. I will no longer try to love. I will be defined by love. And it all begins with the song we sang to Gay, I love you. I love you, Lord Jesus. Amen.